Yeah. Our four presenters represent a range of services that are quickly becoming integral parts of the 21st century music business. They're all different shapes and sizes and different flavors, and we're going to hear a little bit uh, from each of them about what they do and what they bring to the music community. Meredith Chin is the manager of corporate communications for Facebook. Now, I haven't seen the movie yet. I'm waiting for the sequel where they stop the alien invasion on the way to Vegas. Uh, Meredith will talk about some of Facebook's music initiatives and what they might mean for all of you. Uh, we've also got Christopher LaRosa, product manager for YouTube, uh, YouTube Music, I'm sorry, and uh, YouTube obviously don't need a movie because they are a movie. Uh, Christopher will shed some light on what YouTube is doing beyond cats playing piano, but as they say in the business, the kitty stays in the picture, so don't worry. Uh, Jesse Von Doom from Cash Music has one of the coolest names in the business. <laughs> also very cool is his nonprofit organization which brings super nerdy stuff like computer code down to a level that, you know, musicians can actually use. Uh, Jesse will talk about how artists are using open standard technology to build community and take control of their careers. And last but not least, we have Eric Weinberg, who is the president of Nielsen Entertainment. He'll talk about how a well-established media measurement company is responding to an ever-changing digital marketplace where traditional stats meet new metrics for success in music. Now, you'll also notice we have some other folks up here. Uh, this is our fabulous reaction panel. Um, we won't be taking audience questions in this session, so these guys are your proxy. So um, that's a lot to live up to, and I'm, but I'm sure you'll, you'll manage. Uh, we have Brian Calhoun, VP of New Media and External Affairs from Sound Exchange. We have uh, Rebecca Gates. Uh, you can wave. I'm going out of order. I'm, I'm, doing, a, I'm doing the program here. Uh, Rebecca Gates, musician and audio editor. We have Dick Huey, who is CEO of Toolshed Incorporated. And Emily White, co-founder of Whitesmith Entertainment. And she's also a board member of Cash Music. So, uh, we're going to get this thing rolling, and following the presentations, we'll have a conversation with our reaction panel, lightly moderated by yours truly. Thanks. Before we start, can I borrow a pen from somebody? Me too. No, we need two pens. <laughs> Please. Thanks. Thank you. Just prick your finger. <laughs> oh, to the rescue. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Meredith, if you're all set. Good morning. All right. A common perception about music right now is that it's in such a state of disruption because of the technology that we have to easily access and, and, and get music through these new technologies, that it's in some way suffering. This is, in fact, an incredibly exciting time for music. Never have there been as many tools as there are right now at a musician's disposal to reach out to their fans firsthand. Never have there been as many ways to connect and communicate on such a massive scale as there are right now. And these periods of disruption can lead to a lot of innovation. So while music has long been a shared experience, we have a tremendous opportunity ahead of ourselves right now to continue to make music even more social. So today I'm going to talk about how musicians can use 
their Facebook pages, as well as some of the other technologies that we offer that you can use off of Facebook um, in order to make your website more robust and more engaging. Let's start with pages. So, sorry, next slide. So you've probably liked or created a page yourself already, so some of this is going to seem pretty familiar to you. But whether you're an established artist or you're just beginning to build your fan base, Facebook pages are a really powerful tool to communicate with your audience. So take my friend Javier Dunn's page. So he's a pretty typical singer-songwriter. He's just trying to build a following, share his music, tour in new cities. And when I met him uh, a couple years ago, he only had about 100 fans on his page. And today he has over 5,000 fans. So to help him get there, we talked through a little bit about what makes a great Facebook page. So here are a few of them. So authenticity is key with Facebook pages. You and your music should be central to your page. You don't want the first thing that people see when they get there is buy my merch or pay for tickets to my show. Those things may be things that you need to, to tell them about or that you want them to know, but the, your commitment should be to your fans and the value you put into the connection with them. So, next slide. So in Javier's case, he likes to respond to every single wall post that he gets from his fans. Um, he just basically says, thanks for stopping by, thanks for writing, thanks for listening. But even if you can't comment on every single wall post, if your page is too big or um, you just have too many fans commenting on things that perhaps aren't, aren't necessarily relevant, a simple status update that says, hi, I'm still listening to you, I'm still here, goes a really long way. So people want access. Behind the scenes content, sound checks, rehearsals, unfinished material. Um, people want to get authentic, exclusive content in, and looks into your life. So people will be more likely to share those types of updates with their friends and ultimately link back to your page. Here's an example of Lady Gaga. Um, obviously very popular on Facebook, but the reason I'm pointing her out is because she actually posted a video when she hit 10 million fans on Facebook. And it has over 50,000 likes right now, but it was personal, it was brief, and it was shareable. Um, I'm also pointing this out because not only do you, not, well not only does she, had, did she have a lot of activity on the page, but it doesn't have to be a big production with perfect lighting in order to get a lot of people looking at it. Um, the more authentic that you can make something through a flip cam, through a camera phone, through a, just a normal point and shoot is much better. Um, so if you're on the go, if you're on tour, you're a manager or you're just someone who's just out on the road and you, you don't really feel like you have time to be sitting down and checking Facebook and updating Facebook as readily, um, Facebook mobile is really an important piece of the puzzle in order to add to your page. So. Um, every, every page has access to um, an edit settings page where you can go in and learn a little bit more about what type of mobile services might be most useful for you. So you can SMS, you can email in updates, or you can use a native um, uh, application on your phone, such as the Facebook for iPhone application. So Katie Tunstall is another good example. She uses the Facebook for iPhone application and she posts updates all the time, mobile uploads, um, just text-based uploads um, when she's out on the road. So this is an example of um, her just shooting a picture of a guitar that she saw. Next slide. Oh. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so soliciting feedback from, from your fans. So Facebook is obviously a culture of, of conversations and communication. So where artists used to have to wait days or weeks to find out how their album or their, how their music was being received, they can now find out almost instantaneously. So there's an opportunity to bring your fans into the experience with you by soliciting feedback from them. In this case, Keith Urban is actually asking his fans which album cover they like most, and whichever one gets more likes, um, he'll use this as his album cover for when his album comes out. So again, this goes back to being very personal on your page, but this is really just about letting your fans know that they're heard. So I'll get a, I get asked a lot about, well, how do I just increase my fan count? I'm just trying to up the numbers. 
Um, so this last point is really for people who are looking to reach new audiences and have the time and the resources to use the additional tools that we offer. So you can buy ads and target by places that you're going, places that you're trying to tour in. Um, and, and the great thing about ads, these are a couple that um, Javier ran for when he was about to tour in, in a city that he hadn't actually played in. So he was trying to get people to come out to the show. Um, the great thing about ads is that you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money on them. A few really well-targeted ads can go a really long way. And I think that there's a misconception that, oh, you know, I don't have the money to do this. I'm just, I'm just a beginning artist and this isn't what I can spend my money on. Um, the value of, of reaching people that you um, didn't know were really out there um, can actually go a really long way. So take a look at the Insights page. So this is available for all pages for free. And um, you can see general information about the people who like your page. Um, and this is just really great to help you decide maybe where you might want to go touring or um, just generally give you a sense of what type of people like your music. And it can help you inform what type of updates or what type of things you post. Um, but it doesn't have to take a lot of your time to go through and analyze all of that information. You can just sort of glance at it every once in a while and see how things are going. This is mostly for people who are, are managers or people at the label who want to see um, exactly how their uh, page is being successful. So those are just a few tips on how to improve your Facebook page. But um, now let's talk about what you can do off of Facebook using uh, new technologies that we have called face social plugins. So social plugins are pretty much just drag and drop tools that anyone could add into their website to make it more socially relevant. Um, they're just really simple lines of code that, um, that if you have sort of a moderate ability to, to use, um, to, to program at all, just uh, for, for your website, then you should be using these. So here are a couple to think about. Um, so the like box and the like button. Um, let's start with the like box. So if you have your own website, the like box is definitely something that you should be taking advantage of because it helps people instantly connect with you from your website back onto Facebook. So Britney Spears has one um, on BritneySpears.com. You can see the activity feed already on there. And then if people want to instantly connect with her, they can just click like. Um, and then so then the like button is also something that you should think about. So if you post on a blog or post content elsewhere, um, you should try implementing the like button because pretty much after each update, as you can see on the Britney Spears example, um, you can just click right under, like right underneath the, the update itself. And as you can see, it also shows like 92 people like this um, be the first of your friends. So if you, um, if a friend of yours had already clicked like, it would show you who those friends were and then also encourage you to, to like it as well. So these are really great because then basically that sharing goes back onto Facebook and then it just con continues the cycle of sharing. Excellent. Um, and then you can also consider using um, signing in with Facebook. So you may have seen this on various sites, um, on, on various news sites as well, not just musician pages. But um, this is just a simple way to have people log into your website using their Facebook login information. So rather than have a really heavy, area, heavy barrier to entry um, by making people create a new account on a new site, they can just leverage the credentials that they already have on Facebook um, to start building a community. So here are a few examples, uh, Matt Morris, Dashboard Confessional, and Lady Gaga. Um, Lady Gaga is an interesting one because a few months ago, she, um, they, they actually gave the statistic that 89% um, of people who log in to LadyGaga.com come from third-party login sites. And an overwhelming majority of that was from Facebook. So these are just a few plugins that you can use. They're really lightweight, um, and if you have any uh, questions or you're curi more curious about other plugins that we offer, you can just go to um, developers.facebook.com and that will have a bunch of resources for you in terms of um, what other things that you can put on your site that might be most relevant to you. Um, another great resource for you is um, facebook.com slash influencers. That has a lot of the tips and tricks that I'm talking about today, but it also has other examples of other brands um, and other people that are using Facebook pages in a really interesting way. So throughout this presentation, I gave you sort of a range of different artists and different um, types of tools that you can use. Um, so hopefully there was something for everyone. But, um, but I just want to emphasize that with these tools, these are just the start. Um, 
the tech community and the music community are really just much more at the beginning of this than anything. So in the future, it's just going to be more commonplace to easily experience music with friends. And you're going to easily be able to seamlessly find out what bands your friends like, who wants to go to a show with you, which of your other friends are there when you get there, what the favorite performances were of the night from everyone that experienced it. And just generally have an archive of all the videos and all the photos and all the thoughts and feelings and experiences that people lived in that one moment in time and be able to relive that over and over again. So those experiences already happen on Facebook today, but we're just going to keep making them better. And it's up to all of us to continue to think creatively about how we continue to push that envelope and think about how we can make music even more social. Thanks. Thanks to Meredith. Next we have Christopher LaRosa from YouTube Music. Hi, uh, good morning everybody. It's great to be here. Um, YouTube's really happy to be here because it's a really unique and interesting event. Um, so thanks to the coalition for putting this on. My name is Chris LaRosa and I am the product manager for music on YouTube. So I spend most of my time trying to make sure that YouTube is a great place for musicians and a great place for music fans. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing on the site for musicians specifically. Uh, slide. So there's a few things to keep in mind, um, or that I keep in mind when I think about YouTube as a platform for musicians. The first is that, like uh, many forms of social media, it's a truly democratic platform. There's no barrier to entry, um, so anybody can be on it. The second thing that's a bit more unique to YouTube in the social space is that um, video and technology are really transforming the artist-fan interaction, and we're seeing really incredible examples of that on the site, which I'll get into in a little bit. And then the, the third point um, to think about, and this is something that we keep in mind every day at YouTube, is that we're successful when people who create content for the platform and on the platform are successful. And so this, this guides our product strategy and how we, approach, how we approach what we do. So next slide. So one thing that I've heard throughout the conference is that people um, People have different holy grails, right? That some musicians want to sell more of their recorded music. Some musicians want to make, getting a little feedback, some musicians want to make uh, a career touring, right? Um, so there's actually different things. There's not one model for musicians anymore. There's many models. But the one thing that's common to all musicians is I don't hear any musician say, I don't, I'm not interested in building an audience, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's the one thing that's common. And so YouTube's a great place to do that. We have thousands of musicians on the site today. Um, from the top right, we've got Julie Rose, David Choi, Pomplamoose, Julie Nunes, Ted Kaufman, um, Alyssa Bernal. These are just a handful of artists who's, who basically are artists on YouTube. Like that is, that is their home. That is where they do all of their work. And so, um, and how do these people make a good presence on YouTube and get a good following and build an audience? Um, well, they actively engage with video. Uh, slide. So if you look at a band like Pomplamoose, which is really popular on the platform, they do absolutely phenomenal things with the video component around their original sound recording. I, I talk to some artists and they say like, oh, I'm not really into video, you know, I just want to put music out there. Um, but I wish, I wish I had like a viral video. And I basically say, well, you're not going to get a viral video without the video side. So if you're on YouTube, think, think about the video component when you build your content. So slide. And then the last thing I would say if you're trying to use YouTube to build an audience is that you really take advantage of the community features. I'll talk about some of those, but there's video responses, there's promoting your subscriptions. Another thing that's really popular on YouTube is collaborating with other YouTube artists. And we have great examples of that on the site. So slide. So we can talk very quickly about how video has transformed the artist uh, fan relationship in a sort of simple way. Uh, if you take Lady Gaga as an example, she, her manager has basically said she makes her music videos for YouTube, right? She's making them for YouTube. That's the destination. Um, and she has a handful of videos, she's five videos on the site with more than 50 million views, which is impressive in and of itself. But, you know, and I think Meredith also talked about this at MySpace, the way really to connect with your users is to engage them directly, right? So this isn't a broadcast model. This, this example here is Lady Gaga and her channel 
going out and talking to her fans about her politics and communicating to them through video. And then what you see on the right is fans responding to Lady Gaga through video as well. And so this is a, a pretty clear example of how you take this sort of, um, how social changed it from being a you know, fan, or rather an artist broadcasting out to the fans, right? To uh, artists talking to the fans, fans talking back. And this is just a more rich evolution of that communication. So um, jump to the next slide. Actually, play the video. Sorry. <laughs> So, um, but there's actually more interesting ways that the artist-fan interaction is changing on the site. So this is Ozone. They're a really popular Romanian group and had a huge following in Europe. Uh, they hadn't really taken off in the U.S. or developed a U.S. audience until this guy shows up on YouTube and makes a video that goes on to get 50 million views. Um, I'm sorry, 38 million views. But what's interesting is that it's not just him making the video, tons of other users go on to make their own versions of the video, and it keeps going and going and going. Um, everybody's doing it, right? And so you want to talk about engaged fans, right? You don't get more engaged than this. Um, and so at the end of the day, um, the original video had, you know, some millions of views, um, but then the video that the original user uploaded had 38 million views, but then 38,000 fans went and made their own versions of the video and uploaded it to YouTube. So on YouTube today, we have more music videos created by users for the single song than the entire recording industry produced for all commercial music since MTV launched. So, so you can sort of put in perspective just how engaged fans are with content and how what we're doing is providing a new, real new, rich way for fans and artists to interact around the content. So we can skip to the next slide. But, of course, this is great, but we need to find a way to make it work for content owners and for musicians. And so I'll talk about some of the technology we've built to make this happen. The, the first and most um, significant and transformative thing I'd say we've developed is a system called Content ID. This allows music labels, TV studios, um, content producers to give us copies of videos and sound recordings which we use to make ID files and we put these into a database. Every time a user uploads a video to YouTube, we can check that user's video content against the, their video and acoustic content against the library of ID files that we've received from content partners. And we have thousands of content partners at YouTube. When we make a match between the user video and the content owner video, we basically, well, we, we apply a policy that the content owner has specified, and they can specify three policies on the platform. They can choose to block matches, they can choose to monetize matches, which means that the user video stays on the site, we put ads on it, and then share that revenue back with the content owner, or they can choose to track matches, which means that they don't want to monetize the content on the site, they're aware of it, and they're okay with it, they're gonna leave it there. And so this is really the first step in taking the ad-supported model around user-generated content forward at scale. So we've built that, and it's a sort of cornerstone of our strategy. We have that tool and many others that allow people to control how their content is displayed on the platform. And also, and I, it's, worth, it's very important to us actually that in this whole system, we also have a means for our users to interact with the content owners once a claim is made. Every time a claim is made, we notify the user that the content owner has made a claim, and the user can say, okay, I'm fine with that. Or if they feel the claim was made in error or it's not warranted, then they can go and they have tools to dispute the claim or to identify the error in identification. So that's great. We've got the user-generated content. We've identified it. Now how do we really make it work? And there's a lot of different features that we have. How many people are familiar with the JK wedding video? Okay, all right, I'm not gonna play, all right? So, you, you, Numa Numa was enough. Um, so this video, for people who aren't familiar, it's a couple that filmed their wedding entrance processional, and it was really creative. I mean, they, they danced to Chris Brown, um, the entire bridal party, the groom's party, um, were dancing, and it was really, had tons of energy. Went on to go viral, got more than 56 million views. And so, this took care of some, um, some of the features we've built into the site makes music labels really comfortable with this sort of user, user engagement. 
Um, the video was more than a year old. It had fallen off of the Billboard charts. When the video went viral, it went back to the top 10 on the Billboard charts. So you think about how much it takes to get a video to the Billboard charts the first time, right? And then to get it back on the top 10 a year later with no work on the part of the original um, content creator, new incremental work, but rather because of fans' engagement with the video is really great and very powerful. Um, so yeah, that's basically how we take this user-generated content and make content owners comfortable with it. Slide. And finally, I want to talk about other things that we do on the site to create value for musicians on the platform. And the first thing I want to talk about is our Musicians Wanted program. This is something we launched earlier in the year, so any independent musician can come and apply for our program if they have an audience on YouTube and they want to monetize their content on the site. So this is a way, if you have a YouTube presence, to go, become a partner, generate ad revenue from your content, and reap the benefits of that. Second, um, as we think about the site in general, we, we, are, a, we are a video site, um, and we have all kinds of video. There's two things um, in spe specific to music I do want to touch on, though. We have introduced, um, in recent months, a partnership with Soundkick, which basically gives event listing data on the music browse page, which is youtube.com slash music. It's a great place to find new content uh, from top producers and also from YouTube-specific YouTube producers who are also top producers. And finally, uh, we've also introduced the notion of an artist page. So OK Go was one of our first partners in the Musicians Wanted program when they became an independent group. And we have pages that include sort of canonical reference data and then also event data and music videos about the, the group. So these are just a couple ways that we've tried to take the experience on YouTube and add in music-specific functionality that um, allows musicians to get a little bit more from the platform other than building an incredible audience and monetizing their content. Slide. So where to go from here? If you're a musician and you don't have a YouTube presence, I'd really suggest you go to youtube.com slash sign up and sign up and start building an audience on the platform. It's, it's a great place to build an audience. Secondly, if you already have a presence on the site and you want to monetize that presence as an independent musician, you should go to youtube.com slash musicians wanted. And if there is content on the site that belongs to you and you own and you want to control that content on the site or you want to take it off the site, you should go to youtube.com slash t slash copyright program. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Jesse Von Doom from Cash Music. Hi, I'm Jesse Von Doom. Um, before I start, I have to give the disclaimer that both Emily and Dick sit on my board, so um, don't worry, they're very mean. They'll be plenty fair. Um, yeah. Uh, so I didn't prepare slides. I instead wanted to introduce you quickly to our organization and um, talk more to the why we exist than exactly specifically what we are. Um, but to start, Cash Music is a nonprofit tech foundation. Um, you can think of it uh, a lot like Mozilla for browsers or WordPress for blogging, but we work in music. Um, we work directly with artists, with small labels. Um, we develop code and we take the code that we develop and we release it as open source, free, uh, usable code for anyone to use. Um, so far, we've um, worked with a lot of folks, uh, Kristen Hurst, Swell Season, Deerhoof, uh, Zoe Keating, Calexico, uh, artists from a wide range of genres and sizes. Um, we've already released tools to do things like uh, social for download. So um, using Facebook's actually open source libraries as well, um, you can put on a page that will let you click a like button and get a download instantly. Um, similar for Twitter. Um, we've also released code that allows you to do sound and video embedding in your site. Um, it provides UI enhancements, things like that, to play YouTube videos, for example, in a fancy schmancy light box, if you like, um, to stream your music to do whatever you like. It's available free as a JavaScript download or as a WordPress plugin for those of you using WordPress. Um, you can see examples of all that stuff on our site and download it, play with it, whatever you like. 
Um, what the, uh, I should probably first say what open source is for those of you that aren't giant nerds like me. Um, open source software is essentially transparency and development where what we do is we work on our software, we build our software, and when we're done, not only do we release um, a product, but we release all of the code for it so that you can truly own it. Um, you're free to download it, you're free to change it. Um, the only requirement that we have is for some of our stuff. Some of it's completely free, but some of it requires that you also make your changes available back to the original foundation so that any improvements you make go out to the community. Um, we've actually seen hundreds of people download it and use it without us even, even being involved, and some of those are you know, great, great smaller bands like Learning Music and Man, Woman, Child, who you should check out both of them, they're fantastic, but also folks like Pete Yorn and Joe Satriani have used it on their websites to, to do Facebook stuff, Twitter stuff, all kinds of things. So um, that's pretty much my, my spiel on what we are. Um, for me, uh, the why is far more important. You don't generally um, start a nonprofit um, <laughs> from being in the music industry to, uh, to build these kind, of, uh, these kind of tools unless you have a pretty strong motivation. Um, and it all comes down to artist sustainability. And I actually even wrote it twice in my notes because I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss it. Um, something that is often overlooked is that uh, bands that aren't U2 living in, you know, castles made out of cotton candy and stuff um, have a very hard time. Uh, there is really no middle class in our industry, at least for artists. Um, you know, you, you can make a middle class living if you're willing to work like a dog and be away from your family all of the time. Um, yesterday I actually had a, uh, well, what I would describe as a very wonderful conversation with Erin McCune, Aaron McCune, excuse me. Um, she might describe it as a long-winded ramble with a crazy person. Um, uh, but she, she pointed out this wonderful thing, and I, I had never heard it described quite like this, which is that when she was on tour so much, when she's going out all the time, it feels like she has one foot out of her community. She's disengaged and she's away. And it's, it's something that people don't take into consideration when they talk about the fact that musicians should just shut up and go play live. It's not that simple. Some of us have families, and it's not the only way for musicians to make money. So we're basically, as an industry, figuring it out. Now that album sales are down, we are finding new ways to monetize content. We're finding new ways all over the place. Now, there's a lot of talk about streaming and all-you-can-eat services, but it's very difficult to make anything all you can eat without starving someone. And I'm basically passionate about the idea that we shouldn't be starving artists. Um, it is very difficult to pay your mortgage with nothing but royalty checks and um, sound exchange collections. As, as fantastic as they are, they're not the only answer for musicians. When we turn and talk about musician strategies, there is a, a very quick conversation that starts and it, and it says, well, we should be paying attention to our audiences, building our audiences. Uh, Chuck D said yesterday, being the number one fan of your number one fan. Awesome line. Um, it's all very true, but it's kind of been true. Um, generally speaking, what happens after that is people start making a formula where if a thousand fans all pay a hundred bucks per every member of your group, or if you have one fan that's willing to give you a hundred thousand bucks, or maybe two people going in for 50 grand each, I mean, the math is kind of obvious and not true necessarily, um, depending on who you are, and also depending on where you are in your career. It's kind of hard to start up with a thousand people willing to give you a hundred bucks. That's a lot of money from a thousand people. Um, so really um, what we're trying to say is that models are, models are being discovered now. We're all working and we're changing. There's, there's great things happening if you've seen today and you see all around. But in times of change and innovation, um, great power shifts. And, uh, you know, as Meredith pointed out, we are in one of those times right now. I feel it's the responsibility of every single person in this room, and I, I don't mean to be preachy, but if you meet me, I, I am. Um, I, I, think, I think it's our responsibility to ensure that artists are not lost in the shift of power. We have to make sure that artists retain control of their work, that artists retain basically the ability to make a living off of their art or we'll be selling the Rolling Stones for the next 50 years until, until finally that's over. Uh, we need to see a continuous stream of new music and new art because it, it should not be forgotten that without artists, we're all lost. This industry does not exist. Uh, the happier stuff. Um, 
how, <laughs> how we and open source in general sort of helps the situation. Um, you know, the first, the first big point and the reason, the reason we decided to do this um, as an open source nonprofit foundation, um, I should point out that in no way am I anti-label and in no way am I anti-innovation or anti-entrepreneurship. I think all these things are fantastic and wonderful for our industry. But it did seem to, there did seem to be a vital need for open source technology and the reason is because if we have these tools that are built in the open, what we're doing essentially is giving the artists the power to say no, which right now they don't have. When there is a service, and, and I manage a few artists, every time there is a new service, you must be there. You must use it. You have to. You don't know what's going to happen to your data. You don't know what's going to happen to the fans you build there. All you know is that you have to do it. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. What I'm saying is instead it's, it's in the artist's best interest to have that power to say no to those things. And we need to build that. We need to know that the artist has um, a certain minimum level of technology available to them at all times. Uh, I'm in DC, so fuck it. They need a public option for, for <laughs> music tech, basically. It, it didn't work with other things, but you know, I think here's the place. Um, now, the other thing too, though, and I, I'm, I'm very artist-centric in case you can't tell. It's, it's where I come from. So, you know, I should also point out that open source gives a, a tremendous boost to innovation. It allows companies to start with a foundation of technology and build from there. So it allows um, all, all of us um, to, to build off of a known starting point, go from there and innovate. And innovation is what we need as, as an industry and innovation is what we need as artists to pay for extra services for innovation on top of. We shouldn't be paying for just streaming our music or just making a button. Buttons have been around for a long time. We can move on to the next thing. So what I think open source truly does is it, it provides sort of ultimately that bridge between when we look at the services on the side of uh, streaming models that are good for businesses, that are good for rights holders, but not necessarily enough to pay the mortgage for an artist, and the idea of building your relationships, it, it helps you find a place where you can now take advantage of those uh, relationships. So my final point is um, in how you can all help, how we can all help, and what we should be doing. Um, I think the number one thing we have to do, if, if you're not an artist, if you're in this business and you are making your money off of an artist's content, off of an artist's music, you should be asking if you are helping to pay their mortgage or not. I'm not saying for every artist the full mortgage, I'm not, say, I'm not saying anything like that, but I'm saying you have to make sure that you are helping to get the rent checks paid, that you're going in the right direction. It's vital and important. Companies like Topspin, Bandcamp, and Kickstarter should be looked at and applauded for what they're doing because they are directly putting money in the pockets of artists and that is vital to us. Um, if you cannot say honestly that you are doing that, that you are contributing even to this idea of building a middle class for artists, you should start. You should look at what you can do. You should think about supporting organizations like the Future of Music Coalition, any other organizations doing open source, sweet relief, whatever you can do. As an executive director of nonprofit, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have no money. <laughs> None of us. Um, you know, I, I see these uh, organizations next to me, and uh, you know, Facebook does quite a bit with open source, and uh, you know, you guys can continue to do that. That's great. And uh, you know, YouTube, just the same. They, they, you can reach out. You guys work at technology companies that are, are second to none, and and we do as artists need your help. Um, and Eric, not to put you on the spot, but your data is invaluable to us all. And and seeing it opened up to places like the Future of Music Coalition for analysis would be humongous to our in, to our industry as a whole and, and a lifesaver for artists. So these are the things that um, I tend to rant on and on about. So I will uh, shut up and let everyone else talk now. And uh, if I stole the floor, but I apologize. Thank you all.